Hey there, everyone. Welcome to episode one of Rhyme of the Frostmaiden, a uh, fifth edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign, a great campaign put out by Wizards of the Coast. My name is Craig Darling, and uh, I'm your Dungeon Master this evening. Uh, with me is my wonderful cast of players, and we're going to get to them and their characters quite soon. Uh, but first, before we get into things, just a couple, uh, couple little ad reads for you for some upcoming Penny Dragon pro projects. Um, first of all, the Violet Madness is back on Sunday, June 26th. The party have stopped off in a small farming village on their way to the Boglands, but something in the village catches the attention of one of the party members. Will they follow up on it or ignore it? Continue their journey. We'll find out on Sunday. Uh, Fellowship of the Fallen is back on Tuesday. Last time they got together, the elemental summoned by the cult have been dealt with, but what are the missing children and the villagers outside? We'll have to find out this Tuesday on the next Fellowship of the Fallen session. Uh, new project for Penny Dragon Games coming up. Uh, the Great Library of Candlekeep has put the call out for adventurers to aid them in the retrieval of lost tomes and unique books. Join DM Tom and a new party on Thursday, June 30th in this monthly edition of the Penny Dragon streams as they explore the Candlekeep mysteries. Nothing bad ever happened in the library, surely. If I recall correctly, actually, the Mummy franchise began in a library. And some trouble did come from reading the book, so we'll have to see. Uh, Churn Gang is back on July 1st. Woot has killed her sister Clara Bell, and the gods are preparing for war. In the meantime, catch up on Penny Dragon Games' YouTube channel, where you can catch all 25 episodes to date. And, uh, yeah. As, uh, as I said, I'm joined today by a uh, wonderful cast of people. I'm very excited to have everyone here. Uh, we are down a player, uh, Kelson, uh, and, and his character, Iodin, the, the Houndsfolk Ranger, unfortunately will not be with us tonight. Um, but just, you know, really quickly, uh, we're just going to stop and visit each of our players really quick before we get into it. And uh, yeah, let's start off, I suppose, with, uh, with Brandy. Why don't we start? Now, uh, just give us like a little bit about you, your character name, and just just a little flavor. Though. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Brandy. I'm uh, from the U.S. and my character is a Dapmir, uh, war. Uh, well, it's rogue, not warlock, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and her name's Vivian. Uh, she is a spy, uh, and she works with a uh, couple of people. So. She's, she's kind of fun. <laughs> Can't wait to see what kind of nefarious things you get up to. Um, up next, uh, let's go with Ryan. How about you? Hey guys, I'm Ryan, aka Deranged Rhino. I'm sure everyone by now knows exactly who I am. Um, tonight I am going to be playing Rumble Buffin. He's a Furbolg Druid who doesn't look quite the usual standard for a Furbolg. Uh, no greens and browns. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's got pure white fur, so he's a little bit different. A little bit different, but always close in our hearts. Uh, next up in the order, we got uh, we got Jack. Hello, um, I am. My name is Jack, and I am playing Earl. Uh, as you might, if you can see the picture, a very uh, quite well dressed half orc fighter who is. Native native to ten towns has lived there all his life. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Ashton, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your character? Hello, uh, my name is Ashton. I am also from the U.S. Uh, I am playing Katami Clevestone. She is a half elk sorceress. She's uh, six foot tall and a champion beauty queen um she is attempting to follow more in her mother's footsteps of being a sorceress uh but she's good at doing anything it's looking fabulous <laughs> i can't wait to see what kind of fun inventive fashions we get to as we get close to uh competition season actually uh and yeah and, and that's the crew that we have uh today uh next time we get together so not next week but the week following uh, we'll get to meet kelson and his character Aiden. but for now uh let's let's get into it uh, 
just a little bit before we get to our party, uh, just as this is the first session and, and it's nice to have a little bit of context. Um, our, our story begins in the frigid northern province uh, of Icewind Dale. North of Neverwinter, north of Luskin, further north and even to the continent spanning spine of the world mountain range. Icewind Dale unfortunately has been locked in an unending night for about two years. Sub-zero temperatures and furious storms blocking any passage by land or sea. Um, and the people who live there in the Ten Towns are very alone. No one truly knows what has caused the sun to stop rising, but many blame Oral, the Frost Maiden one of the gods of fury and the embodiment of winter's wrath. Her followers are numerous now in the frozen north and have become very influential in local politics. And over the last few years, they've been operating monthly sacrifices of heat and food and worse in the name of appeasing the frost maiden. And we find our party traveling along the East Way Road, at two hours into a trip from Bryn Shander is the central hub of the Ten Pounds, the most developed, the best defensible, that has the, the most population there. And they're on their way to Goodmead, where a shield dwarf named Clint Trollbane has asked them to meet with her to discuss a particularly lucrative job contract. Uh, the trip so far has been quiet. It's about noon, so it's quite dark. The stars haven't come out. And, the aurora that crosses the sky at midnight every night hasn't appeared, so visibility is low, but the trip is fairly uneventful, and aside from cold and wind, it's fairly untroubled. Um, however, now, as a party, you're starting to notice that you know, there's been this storm that's brewing. It's kind of to the south near the spine. It looked like it was going to hold back, but in the last hour or so of travel, it, it is pretty suddenly and violently spread across the sky of the Dale, uh, spreading north through East Haven toward, pretty much crossing your path directly um, on their way to the center of the Ten Towns, and it looks like a blizzard's coming. Uh, the party's kind of left with a choice here. It is... Do you think you would continue traveling along? The city of East Haven's only a couple more hours away. You could hole up there. Or you could head straight to Goodmead, risk the storm, which brings upon its own dangers. Um, or you could camp out and just wait for it to pass. A and I'll, I'll leave it in your hands from here, my, my dear friends, as uh, we decide what to do about this storm. We double time it. Like, do we feel like we could do that and get to East Haven? Well, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I certainly have no intentions of sleeping out on the floor. So, if we could just get to the next town, that would be fantastic. And you would be aware that you know you, you've traveled two hours from Bryn. It's still another four or so to East Haven. Um, so, I mean, going that far, it is certainly reasonable and but you'll probably run into this storm. Um, but I, I, I very much understand where you're coming from. It would not be pleasant to be stuck out in the elements in that. Would, would, would East Haven be on the way to Goodmead? Along the it path? is. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of switch us over to a region map here so we get a better idea of what we're looking at. Um, so right in the center <clears> there, you can see Bryn Shander and then going off to the east from it uh, is the East Way, which pretty much leads directly to uh, a crossroads where, where there is an inn that most of you would be aware of, um, but then from there it would be a turn south for an hour or two to Goodmead. Or you could keep going, take another hour or two to get to East Haven from there. So all told, four or five hours to East Haven. If you decided to go straight to Goodmead, following the roads would take six or seven hours, or you could cut across the forest, maybe shave a bit of time off. Okay, so I, I have good knowledge of the areas and stuff. Um, sure. Um, 
and I would know kind of I would probably know a lot of these forest areas and maybe even some of the inhabitants depending on who's moving around at this particular time of year sure would I know relatively how safe that would be to cut across uh why don't you give me a nature check <laughs> oh my god my rolls never fail me six six um okay with the six the bands of reggets that, that that you would be familiar with anyway um uh, around this time of year typically aren't around uh, other than that you know it, it might be worth the risk except for like the very common knowledge that that stretch of tundra is yeti country essentially they're they tend to congregate in and around the woods. If you were quiet and sneaky enough, you might get by them, but it, but it is a risk. Okay, so I'll, I'll take out my slate that I have with my bit of chalk and just mark to the other guys on the slate, just essentially draw a picture of a tree and then put a cross through it. To say that's probably not a good idea. And then just like hold my hands up like what do you want to do now kind of thing <clears throat> would this be because your character doesn't speak oh. yeah oh yeah actually i suppose that would be a thing to mention uh rumble buffin doesn't talk he, he he will growl and you know grimace to the affirmative and the negative but he, he doesn't talk um Hasn't really been explored why too much yet, but uh, yeah, he, he doesn't speak. Instead, he, like I said, affirmative, negative, and anything more complex than that, he has a tiny bit of slate and a chalk piece that he uses to tell people what he's thinking. Yeah, certainly the maybe the impression that they can speak, but they don't. Yeah. Well, Rumble Muffin, <laughs> if you do not think the forest is a good way, um, do we want to take the longer route then? I'm going to, uh, look over to the rest of the party and kind of gauge the reaction. Um... He would scrub that off, probably draw like a, a very, it's going to be a terrible drawing, but essentially the crossroads and like a, a, a box to signify a building. And then kind of like just tap, show you it and just tap. <clears throat> just be like. <clears throat> what, how long would it take us to get there? About another three hours or so. Four. Well, if we don't want to camp on the ground, this might be our best bet. Mm -hmm. If we're all mm -hmm. in agreement with that. Unless she wants us to get there urgently, I would concur. All right. And the party decides to take the longer route and risk the storm, which after about an hour of travel down the east way is was that, was that what we came to oh. right I, I thought, am i we, misunderstanding I thought, I thought we'd agreed to go to east haven yes what so yes we... along the east way road to, to east haven. yes right, right. sorry I'm i was getting but it's getting a bit vague there anyway <laughs> <laughs> on on the on the board on the slate essentially what rumble buff in a drawn was um like the crossroads with the tavern that we were we would have all been aware of kind of thing that that might be the first place to settle down for the evening and stuff okay if, if that's the case then, then i would agree oh. all right perfect love that and uh yeah i guess the first thing i need from the rest of you as this storm begins to billow in around you the winds pick up the snow begins to very heavily come down around you. I need a marching order. Yes. Um, 
just before this happens, this would be looking like something akin to a say a, a blizzard or a blizzard or something. Yeah. It it, uh, it does look like a blizzard. You're all pretty familiar with what a what a blizzard storm looks like as it's building. This one doesn't look as bad as some that you've seen, but but it might last a while. Okay. Um. My character does happen to have in his bag a a, a large coil of rope. Yes. If if any other people allow him to, he will take the rope out and and attempt to tie himself to someone else. Just so he knows where they are. Just so he knows. For sure. Very clever. That might be a very good idea. Very good idea, Earl. Mm. Yeah. And she'll hold out her hand or um, offer you her waist if, wherever you want to tie the rope if you would do so. Okay, I'll tie it about her. I'll tie it about your waist. Then. Okay. Is anyone else going to uh, secure themselves with a bit of rope? Uh, yeah, Katsumi is gonna gonna grab it and tie it herself so that you know she doesn't destroy her coat by making sure. it too tight. Just tight enough to where she's secure, but not tight enough to ruin the fabric. Okay. Yeah, throw it around the waist as well. Might as well. All right. So we're all tied off. Uh, who would be taking points? Well, I think Earl knows the towns better. I would probably know the outlands and stuff better, but I don't know about the other two. I don't know Vivian and Katumi's uh, experience out here. Usually when Katumi's traveling, it's like in a carriage and it's covered and it's usually just for like pageants and things so uh, asking her to lead is a terrible idea because uh, she only knows how to get places if they're for tournaments not for any <laughs> other reason um, I guess Vivian would look to Earl uh, Earl do you feel comfortable leading us or shall I um, would it be someone with a high perception who should be leading uh, yeah, kind of mechanically speaking, it'll it'll come down to some survival checks. Hmm. Do you would you have more than a plus three in survival? I have the same. <laughs> Fair enough. Then in, in that case, I guess I'd, I, I'd I'd go before you. Okay. Okay. So just so I, I'm clear on the rope situation, we've got Earl and Vivian tied off to each other, and we've got Rumble and Rumble Buffin. Sorry, I'm going to try not to shorten that because I don't know if he goes by Rumble. Uh, Rumble Buffin and uh, Katumi are tied off together. I figured it was like a, a chain. Yeah, I thought it was like a horse one chain. chain. Yeah, no, I, that's that's why I was asking if this was like a full chain or two separate ones. So love that. And you can absolutely use Rumble, by the way. Okay. Uh, all right. And as you tie yourselves off, keep heading down the trail, the snow at this point, it's punishing. Winds are blowing at your best guess, 90 miles per hour or more. You can't see pretty much anything. The snow is starting to overcome the road in front of you, your tracks behind disappearing. It's just all white, except for the three companions you find yourself with right now. The ability to hamper all your senses that this blizzard has, it's probably a familiar one, but it never gets any easier. Uh, Earl, could you please give me a survival check on this first out? Understood. If it, for whatever, help it would give for any of us being able to see because of how bad it is uh, Rumble would have ignited his hand as they were walking along just to give a tiny bit of light to each other Very good. Um, I'm afraid I got an H in survival alright and yeah you keep pushing on the next hour passes and Still, it's just wind and snow and cold. 
you feel like you're in the middle of this blizzard now as the temperature truly begins to plummet and even those of you with protective clothing start to feel that chill creep in and i need everyone to make me a constitution saving throw please oh very good I'll gladly take that. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's a nice 16 there. Uh, 10. <laughs> okay. DC was 10. You all avoid being drained of your strength and a level of exhaustion on, on this first hour. The next hour goes by. Earl, could you give me another survival check? As you're pretty sure you know where you're going, but it, it's just so hard to tell. Not sure. Uh, six. <laughs> and you keep pushing on for a third hour. <laughs> and still, this storm around you does not let up. It is if some otherworldly force is trying to punish you for making this travel at this point. And mm -hmm. the terrain around you is starting to change. It's becoming rockier than it should be and, and there's more trees mm -hmm. and just look, kind of looking around your immediate area oh uh rumble you got yourself a bless hey thanks dave you realize that you know if, if the storm passes you can probably figure out where you are but you are wildly mm -hmm. off course and mm -hmm. can i give can i get a perception check from everyone please Oh. Ah, oh, finally. Got to load those nat ones. So that's okay. a cool five there. Cool five. Cool five. Um, okay. Well. Then what happens next hits you as a bit of a surprise. As as you're walking by a, a nearby ridge, the wind is howling, and, and you hear for just a moment something shriek against the wind some otherworldly howl as a large beast 10 12 feet tall covered in rippling muscle and white fur leaps off a nearby hill and starts charging towards you could i get everyone to roll me initiative please that has very good initiative okay. How does this go again? You, uh, you select a character token and then roll the initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you wanted to go right up on the turn order. Sorry, okay. I missed that one. Uh, nope. That, there we go. There I we go. will. Uh, yeah. So I got a twenty-three. Uh, I rolled a nat twenty. Nice. You're wasting your nats, guys. Come on. <laughs> Need it for the attacks. Uh, <laughs> Blabe <Right>. the dice. <laughs> I am uh, I'm trying something a little new with my initiative order, just on my end. Um, so sorry, could I just really quick, um, anyone initiatives one to five? Five to ten? Really? Ten to, tw ten to fifteen? Eleven. Uh, twelve. Eleven. Twelve. And then 15 and up. 24. Nice. Very nice. Do not 20s on them initiatives between the girls, though. Amazing. <laughs> and then, sorry, what did you two we get? Uh, I got a 23. Okay. That's not a tie, is it? That's not a tie. I very much apologize. Could I get Vivian's initiative score one more time and then we're ready to go? 24. 24, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, extending. So then at the top of the order, uh, Viv, can you all see the map now? Yeah. Yeah, you have a pretty limited field right? of vision. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so that, that is just to sort of represent the storm and snow obscuring your vision. Um, also, as we are in a blizzard at the moment, there are a few mechanical things I need to go over here. So, 
while we're in a blizzard, the winds that get up to about 100 miles per hour cause disadvantage on perception based on hearing and ranged weapon attacks. The sheer amount of snow coming down obscures your vision and gives you disadvantage on sight perception. Um, if you're concentrating on a spell at the end of your turn, I'll need you to make a concentration save. Um, and that is it. So yes, Vivian, uh, with where you're positioned right now, um, this beast, this huge monster that has just leaped off a nearby cliff is just getting into your vision. You can just see it as it kind of, as your turn comes. Okay. Yep, I can see just the little, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so she's gonna pull out her short sword and no. uh, like, well, unsheath. And she's going to, uh, it'll probably take a full turn, but she's gonna like cut the rope so she can okay. move freely away from the group. Sure. And then um, she's going to move closer to the beast if she can. Okay. Um, I will say if you're just cutting the rope, um, we'll say that we can just take a bonus action for that. You still have your action on your turn. You like it. Okay. So I'm going to move up 25 feet to this handsome thing. Oh, right in there. I love it. Okay. And uh, I'm going to attack him with my short sword. All righty. Go for it. Well attempt. I got an 11. Ooh, just shy. Yeah, I think your blade swings wide and it catches your wrist. You just snarls at you, throws your arm back. Um anything else for your turn i think that's it <laughs> all right uh up next to the order vivian uh or sorry to me you've just seen vivian charge forward attempt to slice this thing open and uh just by a margin miss the mark what are you up to um so she being still tied um to rumble she is just going to throw a fire bolt at this monster love it um, just out of sheer irritation because she's just like i we are halfway lost i do not have time for you wolfie please go away <laughs> <laughs> so she's just gonna throw a firebolt at it okay uh it's a 15 that'll hit awesome so that's gonna do seven damage seven points of damage uh, 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 okay. Yeah, that firebolt, it just like lashes across its shoulder, lights some of the fire, or some of the fur on fire, rather, and it lets out this like yelp as if it's almost afraid of that fire, and it kind of recoils back from uh, Vivian a little bit. Uh, would you like to do anything else with your turn? Um, let's see. I, uh, just for her own sake, she's going to pull out her great axe, um, just in case it gets closer to her. That way she can swing at it uh, before okay. throwing another spell. Okay, okay. All right. In that case, um, unfortunately, Vivian, it's this creature's turn. <laughs> and it like reaches down and grabs your shoulders and just like yells into your face and i need to make a constitution saving throw as just like wind and spit and monster breath are just like washing over your face that's a 13. okay uh i need you to go ahead and take 3d6 cold damage. Oof. Oh, still four, and I missed one. Okay. So that's how many damage? Oh, okay. Altogether, uh, eight points of damage Oof. as you are hit with this chilling roar ability. And unfortunately, that means you are also paralyzed for a minute. 
Um, you can repeat the saving throw at the end of your next turn if we get there, because now this beast is going to try and punch you in the face. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> as uh, it is going to do so with advantage as you're currently paralyzed. Woof. Very closely got that 20 on that. Um, so a 14, and then it has a plus six to hit. So I think that's going to hit. Yeah. All right. And it's going to do four points of damage, which and I she think is pushes over the edge as it picks up Vivian's unconscious body and starts clambering back to the ridge it came up from. Uh, and that is its turn up next to the order, Earl. Okay, so the, the beast the beast is down here, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. it, I guess it has moved out of your line of sight at the moment, but you saw the direction it walked off with Vivian's unconscious body. Okay, um... Are these five foot squares or ten foot squares? Uh, five foot squares. And if you go on the, the ruler tool along the left, just like click and drag and it'll show you how far things are. Gotcha. We'll move up to here first mm -hmm. and uh, then close the remaining 30 feet and I guess can try and take a strike at this creature. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, is, is it facing me right now? No, it has its back to you. It looks like it's about to start climbing that bridge. Okay. Okay. Okay then. Yeah. Oh, geez, I got, I got, got not 20. <laughs> yes. Whoa, not 20. Okay, so uh, just a reminder, uh, it, this game, our crits are max damage plus your roll damage. Okay, so, um, okay, uh, would the max damage include the- The modifier, critical? Yes. I, No, I was gonna say critical, critical. critical. Oh, sure, yeah, I yeah, have, cool. uh, I have the extra damage because I'm a half orc whenever I do critical. Yeah, yeah, so we'll do the max for that as well, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so I did uh, Vivian, you've just got an inspiration from the chat. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on here. Thank okay. you very much for that. Yes, thank you oh, very so much. So <laughs> I was from a friend of mine, okay. so he's already looking after us. <laughs> okay, so, uh... Oh. So this would be, like, so it's add on the, add on the extra, add on the extra, the, the extra damage, yeah? Yeah, so it would be, uh, you got a d6 plus 7, Six. so we're looking at 13 plus whatever you rolled. 13 plus whatever I rolled. Okay, so I got, um, 9... Um, three, I think. Nine and three. Twelve. Because, like, Twenty-five points of damage. Twenty-five points of damage. Uh, okay, that's a mighty strike. You catch this thing straight across the back between the shoulder blades, and it actually like releases Vivian's body under the weight of all of that. And it turns around, <sighs> snarls at you. Uh, but at least Vivian's free now. That's something. Uh, oh yeah, he's hurting. Uh, anything you. else for you? <laughs> okay. No. Uh, I'm good. In that case, uh, Rumble, we're at the bottom of the order with, uh, with our fear bold friend. What are they up to? So, just uh, mechanically check if we go into that square, is that still technically living melee? Uh, I would say yes. Okay, cool. So, in that case, I will. No, I'm going to run to that one instead. Um, okay. I've, first of all, as I'm running, I am casting Healing Word on our friend that is li laying lifeless on the floor. So 
that's going to be six points of healing. Thank you. And then Ooh. secondly, I uh, for my action, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and hit this creature. Love it. That roll. I heard the sound as if it rolled, but it didn't. Oh yeah, that ten. Yeah. So I'm guessing oh, that's uh, yeah, no, I, I think it's the same kind of thing. Like this, this creature's already turned around. It sees you coming, and it just grabs the other end of your staff, roars in your face defiantly. But now that you're like right up there with it, um, it looks pretty beat up. Like the, this might turn around pretty quick. Uh, I believe that's it for you on your turn. Yes, absolutely. Yep, that's me. Okay, uh, which means we're back up at the top of the order with Vivian. Uh, Vivian. You just experienced momentary unconsciousness and then like a very sudden reawakening where you're like flat on your back on the ground looking up at this huge creature towering over you. Your allies are at your side, they're defending you. What do you do? Okay, so she's going to look up and kind of have that, whoa, what just happened look on her face. And then she's going to stand up, which is, is that half movement? Is that how that works, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and since she is right next to the creature, um, and he, if I remember correctly, the Yeti is looking at um, Earl. So it's yeah, kind of the, now that things have kind of ganged up on it, it, it is paying attention to Earl and, and Rumble staff had just caught. Uh, yeah, it, it's trying to divide its attention pretty unsuccessfully between the three of you. Okay, um, if I get that to roll down. So she's going to attempt to um, bite it to gain some more hit points. Okay. So she's going to do her bean bite. What does that bang look bite? like? Like, I think maybe this is the first time Earl and Rumble are seeing this, so. So, yeah. Uh, so she's going to get up and, like, go for the, I, I don't know. How tall did you say the Yeti was again? It's like 10, 12 feet tall, yeah. Okay, so she's just going to go for his arm like try to bite um, the back of his arm. I'm kind of how he's standing, depending. Um, sure. And so her uh, incisors are just gonna come down a little bit more and she's just gonna kind of open up like she's just gonna bite it. And she looks very angry. Mm -hmm. um, her face would kind of like turn a little bit paler and have like um, the veins kind of show up just a little, but not a lot. Um, and she'd just go to bite. Love so that. let's see if that works. That's a sick description. I love it. That's so cool. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, that is that. That's just the uh, points of it. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just damage. All right, hold on. Okay, so to hit, so I gotta just roll a d20. That's a nat 20 plus four. So that's hey, a So add your max damage to that roll damage. Uh, so I guess okay. that'll be six plus five for yep. 11. So that's 11. And that gives me... Um, that gets me, I think, back to full health, too. So. Hey, look at that. Bounce back real nice. Um, anything else for your turn, though? Uh, nope, that's, she's going to back up a little bit. Like, sure. she's going to, you know, back off just a, a smidge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe Fair out enough. of grabbing reach. Wouldn't that provoke an opportunity attack? That, yeah, I was just getting to that. Yeah, oh, like, you, okay. you can certainly do that. It, it's not guaranteed that it's going to hit, but but you might risk a hit if you need back. Then, I'll, then she'll just kind of stay there, but retract her teeth. <laughs> okay. In that case, uh, Katsumi, we're at your turn. Uh, before you do anything, make me a perception check real quick. Sure thing. Perception. Six. Cannot see anything. All right, carry on. Uh, okay. Um, which is really funny because it's just, she's behind all of this, so it's just like, it's got to be the snow. I did not just see her bite someone. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> she's going to come up now to about here just to, to continue to stay back. 
and Same. she is going to throw another firebolt. Okay. That is 24. Wow. Yeah, that'll hit. Does this count as one of those, um, what sort of missile attacks? You said Firebolt that. a missile? My gut says, yeah, yeah, it's a missile attack. Uh, oh, but it's only ranged weapon attacks that get the spanish, not spanish. Oh, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Ooh, and that's another six points of damage. Also, thank you for reminding me about that. That, that slipped my mind for a second. Um, okay. Right. Sorry, what was the damage on that? Six. Oh, 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 very fun. All right, yeah, that second firebolt make, hits its mark too, and you see this Yeti, as you've all correctly surmised it is, uh, just kind of like fall back a little bit, knock its headphone out of its ear, recover, and it just like kind of starts burning up a little bit. It is thrashing around, yelling, screaming in pain, some strange language anyway, and it is looks like it's in death throes anyway. It would take a stiff wind to blow this thing over at this point. Very nice. Um, but yeah, I do believe that is the end of my turn because she's quite comfy back here, not within arm's reach of the giant monster. For sure, for sure. Um, which, is, which is a very good instinct to have um, as this thing is going to, it's going to make three attacks. It doesn't use that. Okay. Yeah. It's going to make three attacks. Uh, it is going to just in its like frenzy, just start lashing, thrashing around just these big meaty fists and arms. Uh, and it's just swinging wildly across all of your uh, fronts, unfortunately. Um, so we'll do this one at a time. Plus six, that's an 18 for Vivian. Um, come on now. That is. That is a 17 for Earl. Misses. Nice. Very nice. And a 10 for Ruffle. So that one for sure is going to miss. Yeah, it's, it, it's just swinging and hitting nothing but air. It's so angry and wounded. It's just, its movements aren't making sense anymore, but it does connect once with, uh, with Vivian there. That one. And it's plus four. So for seven points of damage, as it kind of starts breathing heavily after like landing that one hit, <laughs> and it kind of looks up and over your shoulders as the Yeti that was hiding in that tree behind you leaps out of the top bows and charges towards the party, taking its turn immediately. Uh, Katumi, this thing reaches for you and, and grabs on your shoulder, spins you around and does that same sort of yelling gaze attack that they did on Vivian. Uh, can you make me a constitution saving throw, please? Uh, that is a seven. Oof. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And as this thing just like yells all this like breath and spittle and like cold almost you're feeling into your face. Uh, you feel your, your muscles start to seize up and, and you are paralyzed for a minute. Uh, you are also going to take... Twelve points of bludgeoning damage. Or cold oh. damage, rather. Nope, down. Ooh, and this one, using the rest of its turn, is going to grab onto Katumi's body and just start running out into the tundra this way. Yeah, as she loses consciousness, this thing had better not have slashed okay. my coat. Okay. Um, after uh, after about after about um the first ten feet, does it realize that this person has got a rope attached to them? Yeah. Ooh, then okay. Yes, that's right. Because to me, did not detach. Which I mean, Rumble. I need you to make a strength saving throw, please. Not a problem. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. Eleven. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and it's it's still, oh, you know what, I should go for it. That's how this game works. Uh, it's a one, so yeah, it gets about that far, and the rope goes taut, and, and like, maybe a little tight for Katumi's clothes. This might piss her off when she wakes up, but 
uh, they are unable to get away with Katoon's unconscious body, uh, which is going to be the end of their turn, which means that Earl, you're up, and we got Rumble on deck. Okay. Um, just to check. Ooh, it. that's a good question, actually. I just saw in chat. Uh, Rosin is asking, Katoon, uh, you probably have Relentless Endurance, right? Uh, the Orcish trait? Uh, yeah, I believe I do. I had a better... Da -da -da. Um, and yes, I do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for uh, reminding us of that. Uh, so yeah, in fact, you will... Uh, you know, once you go unconscious, it's it's like a momentary thing as this Yeti picks you up and starts dragging you along. Uh, but you do have a hit point. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, okay, then in that case, yeah, now we're at Earl Rumble on deck. You also have a slimmer waistline as well, thanks to the rope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That'll only look better during the swimsuit competition. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, um, you, you mentioned earlier on that that you use flanking in this game, if I'm sure do. correctly. How does so, um, would that apply right now? Um, I would say yes. Um, I, yeah, te I don't, I'm not really too much of a stickler about having to be on opposite sides. The three of you have this thing's back to a wall and are like very efficiently taking care of it. I think you definitely count as flanking here. Okay, um, how does, how does, how does it work here? Um, uh, so I think if you go on your sheet and then press shift, It'll give you an option to roll with advantage. Roll the sheet and press shift. What am I saying? Uh, Katumi, uh, DB Gibson in the chat just gave you a D4 healing that you can roll whenever you like. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so I think if you hold Thank shift you, and then roll your attack, it rolls at advantage for you. So it's just roll for roll. so it's just roll advantage for flanking, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Hang on. That one's wrong. I'll roll again. Hang on. Hey. The dirty oh. 20 will do it, for sure. Hey, very good. Okay, so uh, once again, scimitar attack. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, nine damage. All right, how do you kill this Yeti? Um, depends on how... When you were saying it was damaged by the firebolts, like, how badly is that? Like, it, it looks mostly superficial. It looks more afraid of the fire now that you're thinking about it, but, like, parts of the fur are sort of charred in, in these two spots where the firebolts hit. Um, other than that, like, its condition is mostly pretty bad because of the weapon wounds it's, it's sustained at this point. Okay, well, because of certain parts of my background, I'd be trying to aim to, uh, in, in a way to try and damage as little as little of its fur as possible. Just like um, sure. one quick cut. It's like maybe like in its thigh. I think I'd probably stab it in its thigh. Oh yeah, okay. Love that. Yeah, the, the blade that goes in and it just like pushes the Yeti over the edge. Like it just can't register the pain anymore it, it, it falls over the body hits the ground stops moving um but yes very valuable pelt indeed if you can manage to get that up um anything else for your turn um, for my next part i guess i'd start moving over to to, to where the other yatty is okay love that And that one bring up. Uh, I mean, that's the first I mean, one. Be... Ah, yes, very good, yeah. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll move over to here. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, as Earl rushes over to Katumi's aid with the other Yeti, uh, Rump, you're, you're back up. And then we've got Vivian on deck afterward. Cool. So I'm going to run straight over. Um, as I'm on my way over, I am mumbling something to myself as I um, grip my 
staff even tighter. And then I'm going to try to attack this creature. Natural 20. Whoa, the nat 20s today. Okay, love that. So the normal damage is 8. That's uh, 1d8, so that's 16 damage. Points of damage, very nice. Matt Yeti takes its first bit of damage. All right. Uh, 16, you said, yeah? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. I just stopped uh, to growl at it. Stop it. <laughs> uh, love that. Okay. Uh, any Anything bonus action or anything for you on your turn? Uh, the bonus action was to cast Shillelagh. Oh, um, yes. And yes. the action to hit. So, yeah, that's me. Good. Excellent. Uh, then that means, uh, Vivian, we're back at the top of the order with you. And then uh, we got Katumi up on deck. All right. All right. So she's going to, like, I guess kind of move in here somewhere where she can fit without going over her um, movement. Sure. Speed. Um, and if she can kind of sneak in between these two guys, even though it won't do it. Oh, I don't want to be on top, but um, she is going to attempt to um, stab this one again with her short sword. Okay. Oh, 17 will do. All right. Um, uh, sorry, uh, what, what was the damage on that? Well, it says five piercing. Um, I don't think the sneak attack counts. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply quite yet. So yeah, the five yeah. piercing, no problem. Um, also, Katumi, uh, you got another 2d4 healing from the chat. I appreciate y'all. Good. Yeah, I you're, can you're definitely awesome use it. Today. Very giving. Um, love that. Um, feels good with the chat on your side. Artie. In that Big love, man. Uh, in that case, uh, once you've got that healing done, Katuni, it is your turn. Yeah. Well, fully annoyed at this point, um, <laughs> she is going to cast Magic Missile on this Yeti that dared to attempt to kidnap her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's only four points of damage, but she's very annoyed. And another four points. Getting there. Uh, any of you older school D&D players might even consider this Yeti bloodied at this point. Uh, okay. And you're going to keep your keep your close distance with this. Anything else for your turn? Though? Um... She is going to look at it and say, you know what? I don't actually think we have the time for this, but after you're dead, I'm going to wear you. <laughs> nice. It just kind of cocks its head at you. Like you get the idea that like these things are intelligent enough to like speak and, and like understand like the concept of that, but the, the language is just lost on it. It just looks angry and confused, but probably rightfully so. Uh, all right, in that Rumble's case. Like, mm, really? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that would be a little distasteful for Rumble, but there's a bigger issue at hand. This Yeti is up next in the order, and uh, it is going to use its chilling roar ability on you, Earl. I need a constitution saving throw as it just kind of leans in, gets in your face, just starts screaming at you. Gotcha. Oh, pretty good, huh? 25. 25, very nice. good. Um, so yeah, you will take, I don't actually think you take the damage. Uh, you're gonna Only take... in Constitution you would take something, I think. So... Nope, uh, you do not take any damage. A and oh. also you are now immune to this ability for the next hour. Uh, so after hey. it does that, it is going to make two very hefty, meeting, meaty fist attacks. Uh, it is going to strike once towards Earl and once towards Katumi, who this thing was pretty sure he brought down once already. <laughs> Natural one for Earl. Not going to uh, do it. 
second that one I've rolled. Uh, and a 14 plus 6 for Katuna, so I think that is. Oof. Yeah, that definitely is. Uh, all right. For eight points of bludgeoning damage. Down again. And. How's he looking? Yeah. Yeah, at this point, uh, this Yeti kind of throws caution to the wind. It sees its dead comrade, the, the four of you ganging up on it, and, and like, y'all just won't stay down. The, this meal was not quite as easy as it thought it would be to get, and, and it turns around and runs, which means y'all get opportunity attacks against it. Hey, 17 for seven damage. Okay. 23 to hit. Oh, yes. Yeah, that'll do. Or for uh, 12 damage. Wow, okay. Yeah. Well, that's all the opportunity attacks, I think. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Believe so. Um, yeah, did anyone else have one? I don't think so. Eh? I think the third one was missed, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 All right. So, yeah, that Yeti does take a lot of damage as it turns around and runs. Uh, it, it reaches about the limit of your vision. You can just kind of make out its shape between the snow and the wind at this point. Um, but it is trying to get away. So, next up in the order is Earl. Hey, okay, um, I'll, I'll run after it then. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, yeah, this is not getting away. Uh, Love it. So about move 15 feet or so. Yeah. And then scimitar attack. Hopefully I hit. Uh, 14. 14 will do. Great. Okay. Uh, for nine damage. All right. Kill the second Yeti, Earl. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just just run up and jam the scimitar right into its back. <laughs> yeah, it just stops it dead, falls over again. Not really doing a ton of damage to the pelt, which is nice. Uh, as it falls, although the snow and wind is still howling around you, making it hard to see and move, all sorts of unpleasantness. It grows quiet, and it seems the danger is past for now. Okay. I'll, okay. Um, I'm assuming someone goes over and checks on Katumi. First thing I do is cast Healing Word. So that's six points of healing. So get Katumi healing. back up. Thank you. All right. Uh, with Katumi up, I think this is. Uh, no, we can go a little bit longer if we're going for a break. So, uh, what what does what's the immediate plan of action here? The, this blizzard shows no signs of slowing, um, but as Earl was kind of thinking earlier, uh, and you're all pretty aware, I would I would say that you know, harvested pelt and things like this are are very valuable in the town towns in a place where no trade is coming in or out, so they have to live off the land and what they have. These yetis could provide you a fairly decent payday if you spent the time to sort of see what you could harvest. By the way, um, how how exactly how exactly does um, Rumble Buffin do the verbal components for his spells? Probably in like, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, Ryan. Sorry. Oh, we, we've discussed it, so I'll allow you to say how you feel it would be. Yeah, no, it would be, I think, like a combination of like, like, like you were saying earlier, like under the breath, sort of maybe grumbling or, or, or little things or, uh, you know, am I, does, does that ring true for you, do you think? Yeah, so essentially he does have his verbal components of which he does. He just does them in such a way that he hopes that it would be imperceptible yeah. from the people around him, essentially. Okay, okay. So fair enough, fair enough. 
dependent on perception and passive perception and stuff like that depends on I guess whether you'd hear or not essentially okay hmm so um I'm guessing the like would it be better to try and skin these yetis ourselves, or take them to somewhere that could skin them? I mean, they're, they're bound to be pretty happy, so... Well, if we leave them, there's a chance that their carcasses could be eaten, thereby rendering their pelts useless. Would I, I know... Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Would would I know um, how to skin them? I think that you would have at least a, a basic knowledge. It, it's not an uncommon thing in in the Dale, and someone with your skill set would probably be pretty good at it. You think? Well, if we want to save weight, and as much as the carcass, like the the actual body, would. Um, help us get more of a payday than just the skin or the fur felt whatever um i think that we should try to take the pelt and if we leave the bodies maybe whatever else is in this lovely blizzard would take the smell of this meat over us mm. i like the way you think <laughs> Thanks. i try <laughs> so um if you if you all trust me or, um, you know, think that I am sufficient, because I think I'm pretty sufficient, um, I will attempt to uh, uh, take the pelt of one of the yetis. And if I mess up, we'll just figure a different way. Hey, um, all right. What she's gonna could, say to the party. Could I try and assist? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. In fact, anyone who wants to kind of assist on this uh we can do this as a group check and successes will kind of lower the dc depending on what you find um, but yeah if you, if you want to work together on this then uh, i will take yeah i'd take uh i think survival on this i wouldn't be helping them cut and stuff because of what it is sure um however i would point out anything particular that i know of that would be worth lots, like maybe the horns and stuff like that, teeth, okay. that kind of thing. That's how I'll assist with it anyway. Love that. Yeah, yeah so you can you can give uh, someone a bit to drop that. Uh, well, as Vivian was doing the, the check, absolutely, that way. Okay. I will roll again. I appreciate that. There we go. Hey. That's better. <laughs> That's a lot better. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can actually, like, and especially with uh, Rumble Buff helping out, kind of pointing out, like, things that would be useful. Um, you can find a, a few things. Uh, the hides come away pretty easily between the two of you. Uh, so you can mark down two Yeti hides. They've got a, a worth of about 70 gold pieces. Uh, but they've got a shelf life of 10 days. So at the end of a 10 day, if, if they aren't cured and, and processed and that sort of thing or sold off so someone else can do it, uh, they're, they're gonna go bad. Uh, the horns come away. Um, you manage to grab all four, two from each. Um, they have some use as, you know, you could turn them into drinking steins or use them as components for potions or use them as decoration. They, they, they'll run you about 20 gold pieces each and if anyone would be so inclined, uh, one of the skulls is pretty intact. Like as a, it would be a fairly impressive trophy or something like that, but there's no super great use for it that, that people have figured out yet. So it goes for about 15 gold pieces as well, but that is there if anyone would like it. I think Katumi just kind of wants to take one of the teeth, yo, yeah. just to, to show to her dad, like, hey, you, I went off on this adventure and look what I brought back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. 
Um, and Vivian, uh, I'll take the skull as well, if I can get it. <laughs> okay. Oof. Yeah. Um, I will make a note to throw that in uh, our Discord in the in the party loot channel, and maybe on break we'll do that. Uh, Once, um, <clears throat> not Vivian. Sorry, what's the character name? My brain. Oh, it's Vivian. Yes. Uh, once Vivian has um, done what she's done, taken the part she's going to take, uh, Rumble would probably kind of, you know, arms down by the sides, legs out kind yeah. of thing, cover him up with the snow a little bit. And then he'll also, even though it's kind of blizzardy, he'd probably still just go onto his knees for a second, holding his stuff in his hand, and just kind of look to the sky, just hoping there might be a, a glimmer to say mm. that they know they've been received. And almost as if to like answer your question, it's it's been four or five hours. It, it's getting into the afternoon and evening. And as you kind of kneel down and, and kind of give this little prayer to yourself and, and for this yeti uh, the stars begin to come out one by one slowly at first cascading a little bit of light down onto the dale around you not really enough to improve your visibility at all but you get a strange sense of comfort as if like maybe that was an answer Excellent. Well, uh, rumble is uh, essentially what would look like uh, prayer or, you mm -hmm. know, feeling sorry for this Jetty. Vivian's just going to kind of step back and um, slip the skull into her bag and kind of like put it behind her. So that way he's not, you know, <laughs> having to watch that. Um, sure. And she's just going to kind of stand there in silence with her head bowed, just kind of like waiting to see what he does next and just be really quiet next to him. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, just a few, a few minutes pass while this is going on. I think it takes, you know, a good 20, 30 at least to, to kind of harvest what you can from these yetis. They're very large and, you know, it, it, it is hard work, especially under this blizzard. Um, speaking of, I need everyone to make me another con save as this horrible cold persists. Oh. That's what you get for kneeling oh. down in the snow. <laughs> 14. 15. 15. 14, 15. I think the DC probably will be tanned if it was the yeah. same as before. Yep, same as before. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's funny, Rumble Buff, and in, in, in kind of a, a sad way. Like the cold never really bothered you, but maybe it's just like the stress of what's just happened with these Yetis on top of everything else in the storm. But it, it, it's exhausting. I need you to take one level of exhaustion, please. Uh, and I think that here is where we'll we'll take our break for today um five ten minutes or so and, and we'll get back into it uh, as the party figures out their next move as they are lost somewhere in the frozen waste and see you guys real soon in a minute. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, welcome back to uh, the second half of first episode of Rime of the Frost Maiden. Uh, in the first half, uh, our party set out for the little town of Good Mead, but unfortunately were swept away by a blizzard and traveled for a few hours before realizing maybe they're off course. And as they realized that they were ambushed by a pair of Yeti, which uh, thanks to uh, some, some great teamwork and a little bit of help from the chat they were able to take care of that problem and 
do a little harvesting and maybe they can uh they've now got some stuff to sell when they get to town um we'll, we'll drop right back in uh, kind of had a few minutes uh post yeti harvesting uh, and you're all kind of realizing that as long as this storm is going on like we're definitely off track like the road's nowhere near here I think there's a moment where you got to decide what to do. What, where, what would you be in favor of the four of you? Um, Vivian would probably take um, stock of the area and kind of look around and uh, maybe try to see if she knows where she's at or, you know, what direction to go. Um, For sure. Would that be a survival check or? I think so. And anyone who is also in in favor of just kind of getting uh, their bearings or trying to and moving on, uh, please also make survival checks for me. Uh, 21, we got an at 20. <laughs> okay. Wow. It always good, job. good when it's not needed. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Um, okay, so uh, between the two of you, take some time uh, moving around this space and you know, trying to figure out, oh, there, there's a river here. Um, and I, I know you can't really see it, but, but it, it's there. Um, there's a river and there's some rocky outcroppings. There's more trees. Like We must be close to good mead, at least the forest near it, but probably not too far off the path either. I'll, I'll throw us back to the region map for a second here. Um, and if you see the Redwaters Lake there, kind of at the bottom of the 10 towns, uh, right above that, you'll see Goodmead and uh, the Eastway Road that you were traveling along it. Somewhere here. I think if you, you could redirect to uh, what you're pretty sure is east and north a little bit and get back to the road, or you could cut south cross a little bit more tundra and maybe get to good meat directly from here i'll start scrolling on my slate just to just write good meat question mark um vivian's going to look at rumble and kind of give him like a a quiet nod of yeah that's probably the best bet and then she's going to walk over to the rope where she cut it from her and retie it back to her midsection so that way we're all connected again. Don't worry about doing that sugar. And then um, Katsumi's just going to cast mending on the rope. Hey. <laughs> the spell she keeps on dock because at, at any sure. point something gets destroyed, she needs to fix it right away. Yeah, no, I, I love that you have that spell. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> she will yeah, think the <laughs> That's like a perfect sewing kit right there, just as a, as a spell. I <laughs> know oh, I've ripped my dress. <laughs> Done, fixed. That's yeah. super fixed. important to have. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, super important. Yeah. Hey. Um, so all right. I'll, I'll light up my hand again, and I guess start leading them towards where I think good mood would be. Then. Okay. Taking a sort of what you're pretty sure is a southward route um, carrying on and, and another hour passes in this just endless white plain that you find yourselves in moving through this storm it, it is even for you know the most seasoned of you who spend a lot of time in the tundra this is the storm isn't very strong in the sense that you're not getting blown over by wind but it is just lasting forever. I need everyone to make another constitution saving throw, please. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Oh, darn. Oof. Yeah, and as you kind of get moving, uh, Vivian's got a 12, okay. Uh, yeah, Rumble, you, you're able to kind of lead the, this way for, for a time, and you notice that Earl is starting to slow down, and, and you get the sense that they are feeling that same sort of ex exhaustion that you are at this moment. 
Um, could you make me a survival check, please, Rumble? Yeah. Um, as I'm leading the way as well, then noticing that they're kind of struggling a bit, I'm going to just dig my feet in a little bit further and kind of pull them as much as I can as well. Mm. 22. Very nice. A fourth hour passes. Would uh, I have left? Would I have? Would I have a level of exhaustion now? Uh, yes. Sorry, I, I meant to say that, and then I just kind of breezed right over it. But yeah, it, course, Earl's going to gain one level of exhaustion there. Uh, but you maintain a, g a good course, and before too too long, in the fourth hour, the storm begins to abate, and the snow lightens up. You can start to see the world around you again. The stars are like coming out properly right now. And it's only a few hours before that aurora appears. You see it in the distance. You see good me stuck at the southern limit of, of that large forest that, that you kind of circumvented around on your way here. It's a small village sort of got one main thoroughfare couple side streets but it, it, it is really small you guess for sure under 100 people live here pretty residential pretty pretty mundane at first but as you get closer the buildings here they're they're beautiful they're carve very precisely into the shapes of wyverns and dragons and strange jungle creatures and the way that each and every single one of these houses is tooled this way it, it gives you a strong sense of like these people are very tied to their culture whatever that might be you see sides of buildings carved into jungle scenes with with like lush vegetation that's been like painted to kind of give some semblance of realism but it, it, it's pretty clear it's been a long time since that paint has been touched up and you kind of start moving into town um, from this northern and i'll just throw your tokens on there so that we have a frame of reference um, three buildings or three spots in in, in this town um, kind of immediately <laughs> pop out at you there is a closer to the shore the red water there there is a shrine some sort of old god wielding a flaming sword and you, it's just essentially like a large statue with kind of a, an extended base and, and a large stone slab laid out in front of it and you can see like little offerings little pieces of food or you know candles or flowers the big one that you notice is the mead hall here which is perhaps the most beautifully carved building of all of them it looms two, three stories tall. And Kazumi, Katsumi, sorry, uh, you know this building quite well, as this is typically where uh, Miss Ten Towns pageant is held each year. <laughs> it's just a wash of relief where it's just like, oh, finally, civilization. And, and the last is a sort of medium-sized house that, that looks like it's built a little bit better and a little bit more fine than the rest and you can pretty much draw the conclusion that that is where the speaker of this town lives um but the other thing you're noticing is that everywhere you walk in this town there is this low buzzing this humming that it, it just persists wherever you go can i can i make everyone have a little history check please Fourteen. Okay. Fourteen. Yeah. Nine. Okay. And Vivian, I'm just looking for one from you. Well, it's not wanting to roll. Hold on. Roll twenty. Yep. 
There we go. Hey. It's not great, but. Thanks. All right, it's a fairly low DC. You've all lived in the Ten Towns for, for long enough um, that you would know that the Mead Hall here is also an apiary. The entire third floor, they do bee husbandry up there, and they make the honey that makes the mead in this town, and, and they ship it out from here to, to all the other towns. It's the, the main supplier of any form of alcohol in the Dale, especially over the last two years. And you kind of reason, like, the sheer number of bees that they're keeping in there, to, for it to be this loud, it's unthinkable. <laughs> it is like quite a quite a number of these to, to consider. But um, you also know where you're going. Ne right next to the Mead Hall, uh, I should say across the street rather, um, is the address that you've been given for Wind Trollbane, this, this shield dwarf that's contacted you. Um, not that you have to go there immediately. You're certainly free to check out the rest of the town. Um, what would What would everyone like to do? What time of day is it? It's getting into the evening now. Um, you would have left Bryn Shander at around noon, and it's taken about five or six hours as we started two hours into the trip. Uh, so, you know, we're, get, we're getting into the evening, but not super late, six, seven o'clock. I think Akatomi is going to go and ask for her usual rooms. Um, just so she can warm up a little bit and get out of these boots and try to fix anything that needs fixing. Okay. Yeah, it's um, not a bad idea. He, it, Rumble would probably follow you to do that. Not into the room, obviously. I mean, just to the, the mead hall, to the place to stay. <laughs> like, and are, you, are you looking for a room, Sugar? Or are you just going to hang out here? All right, so I, I'll i just go ahead and get rooms for everybody, if that's all right, while y'all, you know, take a look around. Okay, right, thank just you. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, while, while Katumi is going to secure some rooms for the rest of you, uh, what, what's the plan for the other three? Uh, Vivian would... First of all, uh, Kachumi, before you leave, you wanted uh, some of the pelt for yourself, correct? Really, um, that was more of just a threat. I was hoping it would run off, you know, after I scared it, which it mostly worked, I think. Um, I don't yeah. actually wear real fur. Okay. Either Thank do you, I. though. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, does anybody want any part of this pelt? And she's kind of not going to look Rumble in the eye, but no, he's going to say no. So she's going to look to Earl. As in to wear? Yes. Um, I am, I am fine with what I have. I prefer to have inconspicuous clothing, but I will Agreed. come with you if you are intending to sell it. But I will. Yes, I will gladly take company. Um, so we'll uh, go take care of this and maybe that'll help with paying for the runes, Katumi. Oh, fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'll, I'll get everything all set up. So fires will be going by the time y'all get back. Much appreciated. I'm going to, I, I want to kind of look around the town a little bit see what the kind of demographic of this town would be or majority be kind of thing see if there's any goliaths knocking about okay okay very cool um we'll start with with that then actually um can you go ahead and give me an investigation check uh this is disadvantage right uh yes so 11. it's an 11. okay and yeah as you're kind of walking into the little town of Goodmead. You're all splitting off to go your separate ways for the moment. Uh, the divide, the, 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 there's words that are supposed to come out of my mouth. Uh, the diversity uh, of this town is actually like pretty surprising. Uh, you're all fairly aware that 
um, the majority of the people in the Ten Towns are dwarves or humans. Um, certainly there are members of other species there, um, but not in this concentration and certainly not in this variety. But the first person you pass is a tabaxi, which I don't think any of you have like even seen one in the Ten Towns before. The sort of slender cat folk wearing a purple robe that's kind of reading out of this tome as he walks by. There are Kenku that live here. You see a Dwergar, which is really strange, but as you think about it, like that kind of makes sense because, you know, there's no sun, so, you know, they're, they're not going to get bothered by that too much. But, but, you know, there are also humans and elves and dwarves and, and the likely su suspects here, but many exotic races. Uh, on top of the mead hall, you can see a couple Kenku that are perched up there and they're like sharing a couple big jugs of mead together while they're watching sort of the comings and goings around the shrine of that god in the lake. And no Goliaths, unfortunately. None in this immediate search. Um, it's not to say that they're not around, but they're not out on the streets. Cool. Uh, Katumi, you enter the Mead Hall, splitting off from the group first. And it is loud and full of bees, but it is warm, which is a comfort after the last few hours. You can see a number of dwarves that um, they look like they're dressed like lumberjacks. And, and thinking about it, you're aware that other than mead, uh, wood from the nearby forest is a big export of good meat. And, you know, they appear to be done for the day, enjoying a few after work drinks, and they kind of don't really pay you any mind as you walk by. It's just this big, long hall filled with like a double row of long tables on either side, multiple fireplaces keeping this place warm. Um, and then you see the, the bartender, which you know pretty well. Um, her name is Cor. She is a tiefling with this sort of aquamarine skin. She's got like a little bit of frostbite, like a bit of the nose is gone and you can see like a little bit of the damage on, on the neck as well. It looks pretty recent. She didn't have this last night, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and, you know, she's kind of busying herself taking the, the dwarves drink orders and she sees you come in, uh, immediately stops what she's doing and kind of walk, wanders over to you and says, uh, I, I, just, I just heard that you were coming. Uh, Diona got in contact with me. She said you wanted your usual rooms or that you would want your regular your usual rooms that... yes yes me and uh the members of my party there's th uh three or four others with me um and we have been through a trial sweetheart yeah. just a whole trial it was awful oh my god um, is, is that blood is are you okay oh uh, yeah that that's the other reason why i would love to get somewhere private so i can clean this up i took a couple of hits it's fine we won <laughs> so no worries she, um however though what happened to you honey uh you know how it is i, I got caught out in the storm i i probably should have come back to good me to be honest but uh i, I didn't know if i'd make it yeti have been real active lately so i, I just kind of hold up somewhere but I, I didn't really have uh, any way to make fire or anything like that. So I, I spent a cold night. I, I'm feeling okay now. Thank you for asking. Well, I, I would hope so. Now, you said the Yeti have been more active recently? Yeah, it, it, it's this time of year. You know, around the summer, they've always been a little bit more active. I mean, if we can call, even call this summer anymore. Right. Huh. Because uh, that's, yeah, no, that's what that's what we ran into. That That's... Um... My, my party and I, was, there was two of them. They tried to run off with uh, myself and um, Vivian, that, that's her name, um, one of my party members. And it was, it was awful, but, you know, luckily, they're quite capable, so we yeah, managed uh, to I mean, survive. But yeah, if, if we could just get those rooms with the fireplaces going, we are half frozen. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, I, just... I got my son lighting fires right now for you. Oh, they're, they're, they're all I ready to go. It. I love it. Thank you so much. And, you know, we'll, we'll take care of the tab, so. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, anything else I, I can do for you? I, I'm sure one of those rooms is ready if you'd like to just head up now. Fantastic. Absolutely. And then they'll just come and ask for the keys. Um, 
food would be fabulous. Uh, food and drink for five? Okay. Um, water? Something stronger? Uh, both, please. At both. least for me. I, I can't speak for them. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll bring a couple casks up with some water. And, um, I haven't gotten a ton in the way of, of food deliveries lately, but uh, I, I think I've got some. I'll whip some. No, don't don't worry about it it's not a huge necessity especially for me because you know got to start making sure my, my my figure's good for the competition but probably yeah, sure. no meat for the fur bold. he he's a little touchy i think um okay. so just a nice plate of veggies would be great um but uh, yeah right. other than so that, meat and veggie I'm, just gonna, options? Got that. Mm-hmm. I'm just gonna head on up and I, I will see you later i'm so glad that you're doing okay yeah, no, it's, it's good to see you, too. I, I didn't expect to see you for another six months or so. Always nice to see you. You as well, honey. And I'm going to take my key and head on up to my room. Love that. And uh, as Katumi finds her room, starts dealing with this whole clothing and blood situation. Uh, we get Just back pouting to... the whole time, mind you. <laughs> Just straight pouting. Now that she's by herself, she is just pouting that her coat got ruined, that she got hurt. Um, just the whole deal because she's alone and no one could see her be upset. Is it like dabbing the jacket, like blood, hating it? Just, just yes. dabbing it off? <laughs> think if like uh, Regina George had to do her own dry cleaning. Yeah. This is a job for Diona. Why am I doing this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll head back out to uh, to Earl and Vivian. Uh, you're looking for a place to kind of sell off these these pelts, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's there's not, to be honest, a ton in the way of a shop here in Goodmead. There, you do see um, what looks like the home of of one of the hunters here, where they've got like a addition built onto the side of the house where they're hanging some game and you know tanning some pelts that sort of thing and um and and you might get a you might get a price for them there um but you're kind of figuring if you hold on to this or somewhere else you might be able to get a bit more coin it's kind of up to you if, if that matters um vivian's gonna look to earl and uh earl um, I'm sure we could probably get more if we save it, uh, save the pelt for somewhere else. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent sure how much rooms are, and I know I don't have a whole lot of money on me. So, what do you think would be the best idea for this? Perhaps sell the worst one now, the one that was slightly damaged by the fire. Sell the sell the other one later. All right, that sounds like a good idea. Um, So she's going to smile at Earl and kind of point like she's going to walk up there. So she's going to walk up to the Tanner and how do you do, sir? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. And you're like, where's this voice coming from? Like, you know, you're walking up, you're looking around. This little gnome pops his head around the corner towards you. I zigged the wrong way off camera there. And he's like, "Uh, uh, hey, uh, how can I help you? You're looking for some meat? You're looking for, what, what, a coat? What's up? Actually, I was looking uh, to ask if you would like to buy some pelt. I mean, I'll, I'll see what you got. I, I mean, I, I could probably if work it and resell it or, or, you know, I could probably do something with it. Let, let me take a look. So she's going to pull out the worst of the Yeti uh, pelt and hand it to him. Yeah. Sorry for the the slashes. Um, we kind of got attacked. So the party just, my my com, uh, comrades, we, we had to take care of it rather quickly instead of, you know, less damage. So I apologize. And he takes it from you and he kind of grimaces at it a little bit, like, ugh, this is ruined. But, you know, going over it, examining it, you know, maybe the damage isn't too bad. And finally, looks up and says, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I, considering the condition, uh, usually I'd give you a bit more, but for this, I, I'll give you 30 gold. 30 gold? Um, could I roll like a 
insight check to see how much it's actually worth. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a nine. nine. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think you have like a, a real good lock on what it's really worth, but with that nine, this guy's trying to swing you a little bit. The, the pelt isn't that damaged, and, and although you're not really sure what price to like kind of thumb down, it you could probably get more for this. Okay. She's gonna smile at the gnome and say, well, um, I know in uh, Bryn Chander, I could probably get this for 50 gold, even with how bad it is. Do you wanna maybe compromise? I make a persuasion check. Yes. <laughs> and oh. 19. 19. <laughs> Tell you what, I, I, I like the cut of your jib. You're direct. You're to the point. I'll give you 40 gold for it, but that's as high as I can go. Okay. I will make that that deal with you, and she'll kind of hold out her hand, like nice. to shake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he'll uh, go to shake, and then I think, are, are you wearing gloves or not? Probably, um, probably not. I don't yeah. think she is wearing gloves. There's when there's contact, you get like he like looks down at the hand as if like something's kind of wrong there, but like he, he's very polite about it. Looks back up and like smiles. Uh, Pleasure and like very very quickly folds up the the yeti hide and gets like forty gold for you and counts it out puts in a little satchel hands it over and she's uh, gonna pocket that and he'll kind of now looking a little nervously at, at Vivian um, kind of focusing more at, at Earl but kind of shooting the occasional clans back uh, it, anything else I can I can help you with I I really should be going. Vivian's going to look to Earl. Look at Earl. I believe we are done here. All right. I well, uh, if, if you find any uh, pelts in better condition than that, let me know. I, I might be able to give you a fair price for them. Um, but otherwise, that, thanks for coming by. Uh, this will probably come on to a, a nice piece or two. So I, I appreciate you offering. I know there's not really an alternative, but uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Have My a pleasure. good day. You as well. And kind of turn around and uh, from where you are, you know, you're, you're not too, too far from the meat hall. You're kind of at that main intersection. Uh, looking down the street, you can see, uh, you know, obviously the meat hall and the, the shrine down at the end of that road. Uh, Katumi hasn't come back quite yet, but I think at this point, Rumble would you know, be finishing their circuit of the, the city and their search and um, kind of joins you up as you finish this transaction. All right. Hello, Rumble. Did you find anything interesting in town? Uh, okay. Are you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Earl's, you and Earl both are looking a little uh, tired. Maybe we should head to the tavern, get some food, and see what uh, the Toomey uh, got us rooms for, and maybe get warmed up a little bit. He's so like, I would not incessantly like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably get um, the yeah. idea that he he's he as big as he is and stuff. He is kind of childlike hmm. it's very much it's it's more happiness than it is misery put it that way i love that um yeah. and so yeah make your way back down uh entering into that big warm beautifully carved meat hall the main room with those long tables. It's getting a little bit more crowded in here. Um, you get in the sense that the work day is done. Lots of loggers that have joined along with those dwarves that were there. A lot of 
people finishing up the day. You see a couple anglers that have just come in after a fresh catch. Uh, Katumi is, is nowhere to be found, but pretty soon a tiefling uh, kind of approaches you. She's got this little bit of frostbite on, along her like face and, and neck, but um, seems in pretty good spirits. She says, uh, you, yeah, yeah, I think it's you. Uh, you're, you're with Katumi, right? Yes, I'm Vivian. Oh, pleasure to meet you. My name's Cor. Uh, well, welcome to my meat hall. Um, Katumi's upstairs. Uh, she had just gotten rooms for all of you, and we've sent up some food and water and some meat if you're so inclined. We just finished up a particularly lovely batch. I think you'll quite like it. But it, if there's anything else that you need from me, I, I'm happy to help. Uh, yes, actually. I... I uh, was wondering how much it was going to cost for the rooms, if you don't mind. Oh, it's covered. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Katumi is a bit of a regular guest here. Uh, her, her people got in contact with me and, and took care of some rooms for y'all for the night. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, yeah, it's my pleasure. I mean, I, I'm still getting paid, but uh, you're, you're welcome, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... Vivian's going to go and sit down, kind of pull up a chair and um, look to the others to kind of see what they do. It's not usual for uh, Rumble to be in such a, a not not necessarily a social setting, but a, a, a formal social setting. This, mm -hmm. this would be kind of considered formal for him. Yeah, it will, yeah it's quite fancy in here, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So he, he would probably follow Vivian's lead, as in like go and sit down, kind of, I can imagine the chair being pretty small compared to Rumble's size. So it's kind of like, you know, when an adult tries to sit on a kid's chair kind of thing, like. For sure. You do manage to find a couple that like don't have armrests and you can kind of maybe put them together to like help. Nice. Yeah, little bench, okay. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so yeah, he'll, he'll try to follow Vivian's lead anyway. Um, is Earl also going to take a seat in the in the central hall? Are they going to go up, or do they want? To, uh, do they have something else in mind, brother? Earl would uh, Earl would first um, go up to whatever room they they, they have, mm -hmm. and uh, remove re remove his armor and cloak, and then come down again. Love that. And I think uh, you would have probably at least bumped into Kachumi along the way, or or at least seen her through an open door, dabbing away. Oh yeah, no, she has fully dress. changed. By the way, <laughs> completely different outfit. What, what's uh, she wearing now? Because before, you know, she wanted to kind of blend in with like the snow and stuff, so it was like full white with like a, a nice white trim, white boots, white everything. Um, so it was just like her her soft green skin against like all this white. Now she is now that she's amongst her people, she, everything's a bit more vibrant. So it's a very colorful. It's not quite a ball gown, but it is a very nicely cut dress. Um, she really likes the mermaid style, but unfortunately, because she is a half orc, finding ones that fit her really well doesn't happen very often. So she saves those for competition, but she is in like a nice evening dress and she's like redone her hair and like touched up her makeup. And now she's coming downstairs to just like be amongst <laughs> people and be seen. Love that. And the rooms are quite nice as well, Earl, when you, when you kind of get up there, it's, uh, you know, spacious for, for an in-room. There's lots of room for you to kind of move around. There's a couple couches. The room seems to have its own hearth, which is amazing. And, and the bed is quite comfortable. But yeah, you both kind of, you know, <laughs> Kajumi gets totally changed. And uh, early, you kind of remove your armor, and take a moment and come back down. And you're all, you know, how, if at all, how much is everyone drinking of this meat? Um, Vivian would probably have uh, like a, a beverage and then um, she'd probably stick to water. Okay. Um, I'd say Rumble would probably, probably go two or three deep maybe. Okay. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to add there quickly as well is when uh, Katumi come back down, um, again, not really knowing social graces properly, when she goes to sit down, Rumble would have stood up and like wait until she sat down and then kind of sat down 
again. You are just so sweet. I love it. Don't ever change. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no chair put him necessarily because he didn't. He wouldn't have understood that. But he 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 felt like he should have stood up and then sat back down, and then starts drinking again. <laughs> um, Earl, you just got yourself a bless. Nice. <laughs> Uh, Vivian would kind of take a look at Katumi and smile and say, you look very lovely. And then she, like, she would kind of have, like, look at her own clothes and look back and kind of shrug her shoulders and be like, <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, oh, no, 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 no. Do not think that you need to, to do anything close to what I'm doing. I'm running again for the, the, the pageantry. I need to look good at all times, just in case someone's a judge. I cannot dare allow anyone to see me undone. Understandable. Understandable. I tend to stick to the darker, darker uh, side of things, so I'm not worried about people noticing me. I just don't want to be underdressed being in such no. a, a company. Oh no, you're fine. This this is this is literally my everyday. Oh, well, that's lovely. And she'll kind of take another sip and wait for the food. <laughs> and, and yeah, the the food is served like very very quickly. In fact, like uh, pretty much the moment you're set down, you you can see Core kind of like peering out of the kitchen, like ducks her head back in like, right now. Go 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 go. And, and like two or three waiters and waitresses kind of all stream out and lay down like a pretty decent banquet for for the four of you there are whole legs of goat there are like a couple veggie trays set up and you know alternatives there are just buckets of mead offered up there is pretty much anything like fruits which is very strange you don't get a lot of fruit in the dale and then you find a few berries mixed in there and, and like yeah pretty much whatever you're in need for they've got it and, and you get the sense as they're kind of laying this down they take a lot of pride in what they do they the this show of affluence and and, and kind of graciousness it, it's very important to them and they bow deeply to you as they kind of walk away and check to make sure you're all okay at around this time a pretty drunk dwarf kind of stumbles over to your table he's like hey we're, me and the boys are gonna play a game outside you want to you join what, what game it, it's called sky bunny Rumble's looking very curious at him and then he kind of looks back to like the other dwarves at that table and says, like, he doesn't know Sky Bunny. And they all go, ah! They like take right. a big drink. Like, like, Katsumi being slightly are... familiar with this game is just going to look at Rumble and be like, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, play with us. Why are you too good? Taking the advice from someone that knows better, Rumble just kind of looks away and that doesn't make eye contact anymore like no i don't want none of that <laughs> oh it's okay you don't need to be embarrassed big guy it's fine how about the rest of you you, you want to play a little sky bunny would i, I even know what this is uh you could be a give me a history check Uh, 10. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a game you probably would have heard of this one. Um, so Sky Bunny is a very popular drinking game amongst the dwarves of the Ten Towns, and essentially it involves stuffing a, a lead ball into the skin of a rabbit and, like, sewing it up, and then yelling, Sky Bunny, Sky Bunny, go! And throwing it up into the air. And, and you have to try and catch it after you've thrown it, but once you catch it, every single other person in this game tries to tackle you and get the sky bunny from you and, and if they can you have to drink a keg but if you keep it away from them all of them have to drink a keg vivian's just gonna kind of quietly look down and kind of shake her head at them with a smile <laughs> like ah you're no fun kind of gauging the temperature of the table and feeling like maybe he's overstepped some social bounds here. 
<laughs> all right, boys, guess it's just us. Away! And they all, like, pick up fresh tankards of ale and, like, bring them outside with them. After a few moments, you hear them go, ah, oh, you got him! <laughs> and they, they, this continues on for quite some time as, as you're continuing to eat your meal in there. Uh, and, and at this point, it's probably another hour later. It's getting a little late. You've eaten, you've had a rest. In fact, everyone get mark, mark yourselves down for a short rest at this point. And once you've done that, if you need to do any healing, please, uh, once you're all good with your short rest stuff, let me know. I think I am, yeah. Fantastic. Just checking. I don't think a druid actually gets anything back on a short rest. Just, uh, just hit points, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, Rumble, once he's kind of eating a bit and stuff, he'll grab his slate and he'll just write on it, um, like, shall we go to contact and show it to the group. Uh, what time is it? About seven at night. It's not, it's not too, too late getting there though it's actually uh yeah it's funny the way the, the the light works now it's as it gets later it's actually getting brighter outside now that the stars are out in sort of full force and it's only going to get brighter as it gets closer to midnight but uh you've got some time before that yeah sounds good to me All right. If everyone would like to go see, go see Helen. Uh, yeah, it's uh, very doable. Uh, she's not too far away from the meat hall, as I said. She's just down the street. I guess everything good meat is just kind of down the street from the meat hall. Uh, but you find the address you're looking for, and you're met at the door by a fairly rugged-looking older female dwarf. Uh, and matches the description or those of you that actually know when you know this is Lynn. she's this sort of she's got a bit of a, a wild look behind her eyes like the, the look that a mercenary would have after years of doing her, a job very very well um she's got sort of a darker skin tone with this like flowy curly hair and she's got this big smile especially when she sees like all of you have shown up, and it's not just some of you. And she says, oh, I thought I'd be waiting at least another day or two. It took you quite a while to get here from Bryn. Are you... Please, please, come in. Are, are you all okay? Are you, are you good? Oh, two yetis in a storm, but yeah, we're fine. Hmm. So so you're fine, is what you're saying. Doesn't sound like much. No, no. It's minor, minor yeah. things. Yes, nothing. Yeah, and she kind of welcomes you, and it's a fairly simple house. There's, there's the deck, the, the sorry, the decoration in here is actually like quite fine. Lynn clearly has uh, a fair amount of money stashed away somewhere. As you know, as, as the building itself is is a little rugged, aside from you know the decorative carvings and in the walls and that sort of thing, it looks like it's been here some time without very much maintenance. But she has like the finest furniture and rugs and art up on the wall like, suggestive of like someone who has spent a, a lifetime collecting these things and sets you down she's already got like, a big kettle of tea going and she kind of sniffs and smells a little honey on the air she says oh uh some of you have been uh, partaking in the meat hall i can i can see um I, i've got some tea ready would any of you prefer uh something stronger uh, Lots. 
Oh, tea would be lovely. Tea would be just fine for me. Rumble was just nodding in, in agreement with everyone. Tea is good. <laughs> Which, actually, just quickly, by the way, getting into the house and being in the house, is, yeah. is this difficult for Rumble? I don't think getting into the house is particularly difficult for Rumble, but as they get in and kind of see all the dwarf-sized furniture around, a new sort of problem arises. But then he'll, <laughs> he'll sit on the floor and, you know, cross his legs, you know, like a child would kind of thing, in between sure. a couple of chairs. That to me just kind of looks at him and she's just like, don't worry about it. I've got the same problem, being 6'3 in a, the house of a dwarf. I don't want to sit on anything either, so she's just going to... Uh, kind of cross her legs in front of her and like stand, you know, very, very poised um, so she doesn't break anything. <laughs> and yeah, you make yourselves comfortable uh, before long. You know, she's got the tea poured and brought out to all of you and says, well, uh, no, no point in wasting time. You get straight to it. So uh, the reason I, I've called you all together is I have concerns uh, about some murders that have occurred in the Ten Towns lately. Uh, I think we have the makings of a serial killer among us. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've started to speak to the authorities about this. You know, gone as far up the chain as I possibly could, but was told that the evidence wasn't conclusive and that if I thought this was the case, I'd need to take care of it on my own. So that's what I'm doing. And once we have evidence, hopefully we can get a little help. But uh, these murders, they're strange. They happened in Targos and in East Haven. Uh, and I'm not sure if this one is related, but there was a murder in Tourmaline just last night that seemed to match the description. But there are two things that connect me to that. First of all, the bodies were found in or near cities that sacrificed life once a month to the Frost Maiden. Uh, if my theory is correct, the next one should pop up near Bryn Shepherd, but hasn't happened yet. And I think when she kind of looks out the windows real quick as if to like check and see if someone's listening in so i think that those are lights the children of winter have something to do with it the weapon used was a knife with a blade of strange ice it, it didn't melt incredibly sharp um, i wasn't personally able to take a look at these or, or indeed the bodies, but I, I got a brief report from the examiner. And, uh, frankly, I just, I need more information and that's where you come in. I don't, and she kind of, you notice at, at around this point that like one of her legs is, is, is fake and it's kind of the clunk every time like she takes that right step and, and she's like, I, I don't really chase down trouble the way I used to. Um, so I, I need help. And if my suspicions are confirmed, there's quite a paycheck in it for you, especially if you capture this bastard. But information will do. Anything that can link to a specific person or, or place, anything that can solidify who did this awful thing. Um, I, I, I'll pay for it, but frankly, I, I, I think it's better to just take care of this monster before he kills another person. She kind of pauses and takes a big sip of her tea, kind of chewing on something mentally. I, I mean, that's about as far as I know. Um, I I'm happy to give you any more details if you think maybe there's some questions I can I can answer for you. Uh, if this is 
maybe not what you signed up for. I, I won't hold it against you for walking away either. It's, it's inherently dangerous work, but... What order of these cities were they killed in? Was Is it progressively getting closer to Bryn Shander or, or yeah, um, or are they sort of sporadic? Well, see, that's the funny thing, is that uh, the ones in Targos and East Haven were, were pretty close together. Whoever did this must have left the same night in East Haven and arrived through Bryn Shander to Targos the following day. They were only a day apart. They must have ridden through the night, through the day, whatever. They, they just didn't have time to stop. But the one in Tourmaline, that was strange because that happened last. And there's no clear path to it exactly. Like it starts in East Haven, moves west you know, to Targos, then, then cuts back east and north to Tourmaline. Uh, Hmm. She's going to make a quick dice roll because something might occur to her here, actually. Well, it does. Uh, saying that, um, Rumble will start writing on his slate as well once she finish, oh, finishes her fall. That you know. Hold on. And she kind of goes over to a, to a nearby desk that's got like a old sort of ratty map of the Dale very very old like some of the lakes look bigger than they were and different features just from a quick glance like look different than they do now uh, just kind of pouring through like some file folders eventually finds uh, a schedule of some sort but that huh you bad this makes okay I, I think we found a piece here she sets down on a table kind of central to where you're all sitting. Uh, it's a schedule labeled Torg's Caravan. And about halfway down the list are in order East Haven, Targos, Termaline. The one after that is Lonely Wood. And then apparently it curves back down around Mirduel to Bryn Shander. Uh, just this might... Hmm. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't think of this. Torg, the, the gentleman, she kind of says that with a lot of grease, that, that runs the caravan, is uh, a bit of a shady character. He's been known to blackmail other businesses. He's been known to cheat people out of their money, but as much as I hate to say it, that caravan's got the best stock in the Dale. Whoever did this could be a member of that caravan. But I mean, catching them. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could skip ahead a few names on the list and scout out a city before they get there, but... Huh. That's an interesting thought. I, I I think I'll leave this with you. I think that there might be something there. Would I know anything about him because he's like a merchant? Yeah, uh, for sure you would. Um, and see like how much you remember about Torg. Can you just give me a quick history check? Yeah. Seventeen. Hey, very good. Yeah, no, you you remember a fair bit of what you've learned about Torg over the last few years. Uh, they are a halfling, sort of a greased back kind of mafioso haircut going on, and oh. always wearing suits that look very expensive. But Katumi would know that they're actually quite cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and is very, very well known in your circles anyway as being a bit of a shyster. And people that Torg surrounds him with are no better. They, these are ex-mercenaries, thieves, and just a, a whole gang of ne'er-do-wells. But they've never been tied to any real crime before, just rumors. 
You'd also remember that the last time you saw Torg going through Brinchander, he had a couple new additions to his crew. A family by the looks of them. A, a woman older and, and uh, what you would have assumed to be her son and daughter. None of which seemed bothered by the cold. In, in fact, the son was walking around essentially in like a, a light vest, no undershirt, nothing. It's very strange. and kind of sticks out in your mind. So I'm going to relay this to everyone else, um, just from what I know about him and how irritated my, my father is whenever he shows up, just because it's like, you're here messing up everyone else, not just me, but everybody else in Bryn Shander's chance at like making money. <laughs> They're kind of like, you know how like when the dads of a neighborhood get together to get rid of rabbits, that's kind of what it is <laughs> with sure. the, the shopkeepers. Neighborhood watch. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the greater good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Vivian's going to look to the dwarf and say, uh, is there any other um, nefarious acts, uh, any other disappearances along with these murders? Oh, <laughs> she starts laughing like, like a little manically. Uh, she like collects herself. It's like, dear, there have been weird things happening all over the pale community. Um, if you want specifically disappearances, uh, and she like kind of goes back to that desk, rummages through a few like hand scrawled notes. Uh, yeah, there was some children taken from Dugan's Hole just down the road uh, about two days ago. Uh, East Haven reported a whole family of anglers that went missing. Uh, they went out for fish and, and never came back uh, i i heard something about the speaker at Kerkonig being missing but I, I was just in contact with him it, it, i mean it was through a letter but apparently no one's seen that speaker in quite a while but apparently he's, he's in the castle there but uh, no one's seen him but mm. uh yeah no there's a lot of weird things happening across the dale right now but those are specific to abduction have you seen any children of Ar uh, Ariel th come children through? Children of Ariel, yeah. No, they they have a presence in every town. Um, and she kind of like stands up again to look out the window behind you. And they give me the fucking creeps, to be honest with you. I don't like them. They're, there's something about them. They, they act all noble in their sacrifice and clear in the roads of snow and all this, but that dagger, the, the blade of it, it, it made me think of something I saw uh, a, a priest of oral wear once, but I can't be sure if it's the same thing. Maybe if I had a better look at it. Okay. Sounds... Uh, but, but to answer your question, yes, they, they're in every ten town at this point. That's what I thought. Um, I didn't know if you had seen them. Uh, sometimes these kind of acts go along with you know, them being near. So, not a big fan of the sacrifices myself. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's been, what, two years now? And she kind of just, like, gestures up and like, hasn't done a shit bit of good yet. No, it has not. Rumble's probably going to show her the slate now at this point. And on the slate, he's written, essentially, do you know if any of the victims were Goliath. It's a very specific question, but actually one was. Um, yeah, the, 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 the one in Termaline, the most recent one, uh, that, that was a Goliath. I, I didn't get much of a physical description of him, but for sure it's a Goliath. quickly like scribbles it out and just writes trader question mark i i, I wish i knew it, it, it forgive me for being a, a little bold here but it sounds like you're looking for someone and i i wish i could be of more help but really all i know is that a goliath was killed yesterday and the 
MO of that kill seem to be in line, but I haven't had the time to make it up there and take a look at myself yet. You're just kind of not kind of half sad, but also thankful for the info kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'll keep my ear to the ground uh, by the, the time you're, you're, you're back, or maybe not, maybe it'll be a, a few more days or whatever, but uh, I'll, I'll see what I can learn about any Goliaths in the area lately for you. And then I'll just write out his name as well, so she has that as point of reference. And she, like, stares at it for a moment. Like, oh, yeah. Oyar, Oyar Minarkok. Oh, okay. Uh, she like takes her own piece of paper and like writes it down so she gets the spelling right, uh, and sets that kind of back in, in the file folder on her desk. And says, uh, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll do what I can. Uh, I, unfortunately, I can't make very much in the way of promises, but I will make the effort. You just not so like thankful. Uh, I mean. We're all alone up here. We gotta help each other, right? No one else is gonna. True. He, he'll just true. like point around to the group and be like, like nodding, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I, I did want to give you uh, something. I, I'm sure you're all quite adept at hunting and catching your own food, but sometimes. You need something a little quicker and stronger. And she she grabs a satchel that's got ten basic healing potions in it and just kind of throws it on the table for you. Should be about two each. It'll help in a pinch, but won't do very significant amount of, of healing. Vivian's Anything fine. that keeps a stand in, honey. Thank you. We appreciate this. No, I mean, thank you for agreeing to help me. Um, frankly, I was beginning to lose hope. I, I just had a very disappointing trip in Bryn Shander. And I really thought I was going to get the help I needed then. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't to be, so I'm very thankful for you as well. And she spends another... 20 minutes or so just kind of giving you kind of the lay of the land and like routes you could take and before long there is a, a bit of a pause in the conversation and she says I, I you know I, I don't really know what else it is I can, I can tell you that as far as what I've been able to gather that that's about it um if I if there's anything else I can do uh, to help you, uh, I, I will. Uh, I, I've already got your payment set aside. That, that's all yours when the job's done. Uh, I just I, I really feel that this needs to be dealt with. So uh, any way that I can help, I will. Um, at this point, Kathy is gonna just kind of look at her and be like, "My mother believes you, which is why I'm here. So we're gonna do everything we can to stop all this." But I do believe it's getting late in the evening and we should take our leave. Well, I, I mean, you're certainly welcome to stay, but I, I get it. It is getting a little late. And, you know, strange things happen under that aurora. So, yeah, perhaps it is best to be. I was more worried about the drunk dwarves playing the game in the middle of the street. Oh, man, I love Sky Bunny. <laughs> She kind of like looks down the street to see if they're still playing. She's like, maybe I'll go do some of that once once we're done here. <laughs> Rumble's face, although he's, he's, he's just like grinning, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 like he saw him as he was, as we were walking to the to the door's house, and even he was like, actually, that's quite fun, kind of. I will never begrudge anyone who wants to play, but I am not dressed for this game this evening. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, so after Katumi said what she said, Rumble or stand up, kind of feeling a bit like, oh, the, we leave, kind of thing. Stands up, ready to go, kind of thing. 
Vivian would stand up and follow him. Sure. Yeah, and they're all before he I leaves. Believe. Yeah. He will uh, turn to the dwarf and just offer his arm, not as a handshake, but as a warrior's shake. So, like you know, forearm to forearm kind of. Thing. Absolutely, yeah, and she's like actually pretty jazzed about this, and she gets the the predator forearm to forearm like flex grip with you, yeah. uh, and you know, kind of gives you a, a bit of a nod of maybe approval. Like, you know, it's been a long time someone shook, shook her hand like that. Uh, uh, you, yeah, you have four will be fine. Um, oh, I should mention, um, there is a uh, fifth member uh, of our little group that will be joining you. Um, he's a little busy over near Kerdinaval at the moment, but he should be arriving sometime in the morning. Um, but you're just at the Mead Hall, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll let you know where you are. Uh, his name's I Can't miss him. Uh, very clearly a ranger, uh, and he's, he's a hound's folk. Uh, and so I, I will let him know where you are, so you don't head out without him in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Clint kind of take. She actually like Clint does take the time to like shake your hands individually and like say goodbye and thank you each like one by one like the, the appreciation from this woman that has just been ignored for what sounds like the better part of a week now and she is just like so happy that someone is going to look after this and you know, takes you out like walks you out of the house and, and as soon as everyone's out she uh, it's like you know i i am feeling a bit better i think i will go play sky rabbit sky bunny rather <laughs> and she like kind of want like not even like wanders like it's like a bit of a shuffle and every like right step you hear a clunk a clunk a clunk a clunk as she like gets over but it doesn't seem to bother her at all it seems to be like a wound that she's had for some time she's had time to get used to it so she's actually like quite nimble uh she joins into the festivities over there um, and immediately you can tell she's like very very good at this game uh she's like <laughs> when it's her turn to tackle she she's very very quick very strong despite you know uh, her whole deal uh but yeah um i guess my party the, my question is is there any other gallivanting for this evening before we tuck into bed i think so um i would I, I would try and find, um, maybe on the way back, I'll see if I can find like a, um, a little like rat or something of similar nature around. Um, and I'll kind of just sit, if I find this rat, I'll, you know, just kind of briefly like kind of get its um, approval to kind of like be around it kind of thing that way mm -hmm. um and i will kind of lift it up if if it allows me to and just like holding it in my hands and just whisper to it to say keep us or not to keep us safe but alert us if there's any major danger okay and, then and uh, yeah, it's not it's not so much a rat actually as it is this this little silver furred fox that kind of pops its head out from between a few bushes and seems to be quite comfortable here in the town. So it's like used to being around people, and very easily you're able to like kind of get close to it and, and hold it, and it lets you speak to it. And it seems quite friendly actually. I'll. I'll sneak it a couple of the the berries that I'd pocketed from the meal that we'd had. Pops them uh, down. Yeah. Loves them. They're very, very tasty. And, then, and yeah, that's a uh, speech of beast of beef, yeah? Yes. Yeah, so is that is that a one way? Can they talk back to you? No, so uh, essentially I can communicate with a, a beast um, or plant and mm -hmm. they understand what I'm saying. But they have, I have no particular way to understand them unless it's a very obvious, you know, 
you know, the dog pointing that way kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, so they, they understand me, though. Okay. And yeah, I, I think that there's no problem that, like, the fox kind of jumps down out of your hands and you see it kind of post up sentry in a little bush nearby the front door of the meat hall. And every once in a while, you can see it, its little snout and eyes poking out, just like looking around, making sure everything's okay. Seems as though you've made a friend. Awesome. Yeah, and just head back in with the rest of them. And uh, anything else before we have a little sleep, my friends? Or are we all tuckered out for the day? Um, Natsumi has been working on her alchemy skills. Um, mm -hmm. So she is very grateful for those healing potions, but she's also been attempting to make her own. So if there's any way to gather up supplies to maybe make some some extra healing potions before, you know, before she heads off to bed uh, to see if she can get it right this time, that would be spectacular. Okay. And I, and I think the mead hall actually has like a lot of the materials you need on hand to do this. Uh, yeah, go ahead and make me. Um, it's a d20 and you're proficient with it. So yeah, d20 plus your proficiency modifier. Uh, d20 plus two. Ah, uh, that is a six. <laughs> Okay, it, it's it's not your best attempt, um, and, and in fact, like when you're finished, uh, you've got a potion, but it's not like that sort of red that the that they're typically uh, are, mm -hmm. are, is associated with healing potions. This one is more of like a purple, <laughs> and you're pretty sure it's it's gonna do something, but you're not sure what. Got it. <laughs> I'll save this for later. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah, something <laughs> seems to have gone wrong in the actual brewing of this potion, but through happy accident, you, you've, or maybe unhappy accident, we'll have to see. Um, you've, you've created something else instead. Yeah. <laughs> Been through enough wrong ones to know that this is not what I meant, but it doesn't <laughs> smell terrible. So... Maybe we'll yeah. try it. <laughs> and as the night kind of comes to a close. Um, I will say uh, when I get into my room, if the fire's been on, I can imagine it's pretty warm. It, it's fairly warm. Yeah, yeah. The, the ventilation is such in, in the mead hall that um, a lot of the heat actually kind of gets redirected into the apiaries on the third floor. And, okay. and it keeps like the bees alive during this, this sort of endless wintry night that you find yourself in. But um, so I'm not. Yeah, it might be much. a little uncomfortable. Okay. Well, then I'll I'll crack the wind uh, ever so slightly and use my staff if I have to 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 wedge it so that sure. it's not too open, not too shut, to let a bit of the cold through. And then I'll actually um, assuming there's a window to the room. Absolutely, there is. It's uh, currently pointing. You're, you're actually kind of lucked out. You've got the room at the end of the hall, and so the, the windows here look over to the southeast, over the red waters and the tundra, and you can see far in the distance kind of the beginning foothills of the Spine of the World mountain range as well. Perfect. So Rumble would probably, um, you know, grab his bedroll kind of thing, but put it on the floor where... The, the, the starlight and the moonlight comes through the window onto the floor so that when he lays down he's in the starlight okay and as you sort of slowly drift off to sleep you kind of lose track of time and, and before you know it it's midnight and you know this because you're watching the stars and you're seeing that that weird star that you see every night this almost greenish blue seems bigger and closer than the rest but it streaks across the sky and behind it it's almost like a jet trail like exhaust spreading out behind it as it crosses over the night sky 
releasing a vast aurora and the entire tundra is lit in this pale green sickly light that at times changes hues blues red it, it would be almost peaceful if it wasn't so foreboding and everyone mark yourselves down for a long rest yeah. you're all going to level up oh yeah and Thank you. Wait, that means more terrible stuff is coming at us. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll all be level two. Um, typically, I like to do rolled hit points. We've got a few minutes here. If you guys want to do your hit point rolls live and see how much you go up. Yes. Um, if you would rather take the average, if it's like a one or a two, please take the average. But I, I like to roll for it usually. I, I always roll. It makes it more fun. For me, anyway. So, please be good. Oh! Yeah. So, yeah, feel free to take the average. <laughs> uh, what's that? Five, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I might do that this time. <laughs> yeah. And that, that. And. Ooh. What is what's going on there? Oh, there we are. <laughs> apparently, mine apparently decided to do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Was they were they the history rolls from earlier that just suddenly come through? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay, probably. My computer's kind of running a little behind. So that's. Uh... Oh damn. Second level is interesting for a druid. This is going to be fun. Yep. As my good friend and failed Jedi, Anakin Skywalker, once said, this is where the fun begins. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I think we'll leave it there for tonight, folks, uh, as you have this long rest. And, um, those of you with a level of exhaustion can, can take that off your sheet. Um, the night goes by quietly until pretty early in the morning, maybe an hour or two before you would have been getting up anyway when there is a large crash from downstairs and the sounds of yelling and screaming as something big is moving through the first floor. Uh, and that's where we'll pick it up in two weeks' time. Yes. All right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but so... I guess uh, from, from all of us here, everyone who's been watching, uh, I hope you've had a great time. I've had an awesome time with this first session. This is going to be a ton of fun with this party. I can already feel it. Uh, and more than that, I, I love this module. and I think we're going to have a great time. Um, we will not be on next week. Instead, next week is going to be the first session of Candlekeep, I believe. Let me yeah. just double check that. Um, it yes, it is. And then, yeah, we've also got uh, Fellowship of the Fallen coming up and Violet Madness and Turn Gangs back on July 1st. And there's a lot of stuff coming up, uh, a lot of exciting things starting up and continuing. Um, so, yeah, thank you for, for hanging out with us. Uh, and I hope you all have a great week. We'll see you in two. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.